Bokir Tov, good morning uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, uh, last but not least day of this uh, 15th uh, annual conference of the, of the ICT. I hope you all have had a, uh, an enjoyable and stimulating and interesting uh, uh, conference. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Amichai Magen. I'm a senior lecturer here at the Law School of uh, Government. Um, I'm also a fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, but most um, specifically and, and relevantly to, to our proceedings this morning, uh, I run a program on governance and political violence here at the, the ICT. We started this program uh, four years ago, so I think it's fair to say that we were a little bit ahead of the, ahead of the curve uh, in terms of uh, seeing that issues of uh, state failure, governance, the rise of non-state armed groups as not just terrorist organizations, but also political actors, economic actors, social actors, will be of great relevance to, uh, uh, to our region and indeed the world in the sort of post-Arab Spring uh, uh, environment. And our work has really uh, evolved uh, in, in these areas over the last um, uh, four years, as, as I say. Uh, my role in this workshop is, um, is rather procedural, mostly procedural. I will um, try to give some kind of conceptual introduction, which I invite both the panelists and the audience to challenge and attack and, uh, and, and try to undermine. We say in Hebrew, uh, the Talmud says, Kinat sofrim tarbe jealousy between scholars uh, increases wisdom. So as you know, in the Israeli uh, Jewish tradition, we want to have an argument. And, and I want to, for that argument to be, uh, to be conducted by, by our distinguished panelists, but also by the audience. We deliberately set up these workshops to be sort of seminar size, to be uh, uh, rather intimate because we want uh, interaction. And we have uh, three hours this morning, so we have, we have plenty, of, uh, plenty of time. Um, so what I want to do is to, to offer some kind of analytical framework, some kind of conceptual framework. I'll also share with you some unpublished uh, findings that I've been working on over the last uh, uh, several months. Uh, within the ICT on the, on the governance crisis in the Middle East and the possible implications of that uh, for terrorism, but also for political violence more broadly, for insurgency, for civil war, um, and, and so on and so on and so forth. And then I will uh, uh, ask and invite each one of our distinguished uh, panelists, uh, and they are indeed uh, very, very uh, distinguished, each, each in their own right, uh, to make an opening statement, a relatively short opening statement, 10, 12, 12 minutes, uh, on a topic that we have identified in advance. Uh, we will have uh, Ambassador uh, Clemens von, von Gotze open, uh, and then we will uh, move to Ambassador Dimitar uh, Mikhailov, uh, Dr. Uh, Jonathan uh, Spire, and, uh, and finally, Ambassador Ivo Schwartz, as you can see, they're all sitting in the, in the correct, uh, in the correct uh, speaking order already. Uh, how lucky for me as, as, as the chairman. Uh, and then we really open it up, and we open it up to, to debate and discussion, and we really want to uh, ask challenging questions because that's how, we, that's how we get wiser, hopefully, or at least a little bit less ignorant uh, as, time, as time goes by. So uh, let, let me uh, open by, by uh, uh, proposing uh, some, some uh, insights and, and some an, uh, analytical, analytical uh, ideas. And, uh, and at the end of my presentation, I want to also set out a series of questions, which I hope, uh, this is a surprise for our panelists, I haven't delivered this list of questions to them in advance, but I hope it will also help us to stimulate uh, some, some, some debate, panelists and, and, the, and the audience. Um, let me say something just in opening about contemporary patterns of, of, of international terrorism, uh, and specifically uh, uh, focus on the MENA region. When I say MENA, I mean Middle East and North Africa. All the figures that I'm going to present have excluded the Gulf uh, uh, princedoms and, 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 and so on, because I think that that's a rather different area. We're really focusing on the Levant and, and, and North Africa, okay? Um, and um, what I've done over the, over the summer is to sort of look at the, the data relating to terrorist uh, incidents, casualties, and so on and so forth um, in, in, the, uh, in the international system. Uh, and, and in the MENA region, and to try to reach some, uh, some, some conclusion. Uh, the first thing that we see, and, and you will notice, I hope that you'll be able to see, all these figures are post-9-11, and that's 
purposefully so, because I think we live in a, in a, in a very different international terrorist environment post 9-11. Some would argue post Afghanistan and Iraq as well. Okay, so um, when we look at the bulk of the literature prior to 9-11, but even, you know, up until, you know, three or four years ago, um, um, there, there seems to be not a consensus, but the dominant theory is that democracies um, tend to be um, uh, the subject of, of greater uh, attack that terrorists favor, attacking uh, uh, democracies, um, and, and there are various theories that have been developed for why that might be. When I looked at the, the data, I found uh, that this is certainly post 9-11, really not the case. Uh, what you see here, and I, again, I apologize, it's a little bit difficult uh, to, to see, but what I've done is to, is to track uh, terrorist incidents by categories of countries, liberal democracies, what we call polyarchies, which are sort of less liberal democracy, electoral democracies, minimalist democracies, uh, multi-party autocracies, which are sort of more competitive, open autocratic regimes. Think about uh, Russia and Venezuela rather than uh, North Korea or Turkmenistan. Uh, finally, closed autocratic regimes, and then uh, a category for failed states, which is the red, the red axis. What you see here is that by far in the post-9-11 world, it is failed states, what I prefer to call areas of limited statehood, that contain by far uh, the largest number of incidents. It's even more pronounced when we look at casualties uh, of uh, uh, um, terrorist, uh, terrorist attacks. Um, just to, just to, to show you, there's a huge debate in the, in the literature, who is more, more vulnerable, democracies or dictatorships? As I mentioned, the bulk of the literature has tended to say that democracies are more vulnerable to, I'm talking about international terrorism here, yes, cross-border international terrorism. Um, and, and in fact, what we see, I think, is that liberal democracies are actually far safer um, than both weaker democracies, but certainly when it, when it compares to, uh, to, to failed states. And, and the, the literature on, on uh, regime type and, and political violence has tended to sort of ignore uh, state failure and issues of state capacity for a long time. Uh, what you'll notice here, which is interesting, I'll just flag this, I won't linger on this very much, is that closed authoritarian regimes, North Korea, Turkmenistan, uh, Saudi Arabia, closed uh, authoritarian regimes that do not allow multi-party competition, even fake political competition, are substantially safer than, if you like, liberalized autocracies, okay? We're talking about the Egypts uh, of this world, or Pakistan, and so on and so on. And so on. so, th so th there is a sort of, a, if you like, a kind of a bell curve, a sort of a, a, a reverse bell curve, where uh, closed authoritarian regimes are not as safe as liberal democracies when it comes to terrorist incidents and casualties. But as a country liberalizes, there is a, at least a transitional period where the risk of terrorism actually increases, goes up substantially. But once you reach a certain level of democratic consolidation, protection of, of uh, civil and political rights, the rule of law, and so on and so forth, assuming that you have a functioning state, levels of political violence and risks of terrorism actually drop dramatically. And again, when we look not just at liberal democracies, but also polyarchies, if you like, illiberal democracies, as Fareed Zakaria has called them, levels of, of terrorist incidents are actually much, much lower. Now, why don't we have that sense when we open a newspaper every day? Because democracies tend to report uh, terrorist attacks much more than autocracies, um, and, and, and the, the media footprint of terrorist attacks uh, tends to be much greater in, in democracies and open societies than it tends to, to be in closed uh, societies, and, and, and so on and so forth. There's a literature arguing that there's, in fact, gross underreporting of terrorist attacks in authoritarian regimes, and, uh, of course, uh, a problem with collection of data in failed states. Right. Okay, so uh, this is um, uh, something about contemporary patterns of, of terrorism. Okay? Now, before we begin to get into governance failures and geopolitics and, 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 uh, and, the, and the governance terrorism nex nexus, let's um, uh, bear in mind, uh, uh, first of all, um, that the, the Middle East is something of an anomaly today. The world is actually becoming safer over time, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you this. But we've had this huge spike of violence in North Africa, in the Middle East. 
interestingly, what my figures show is that this spike of violence does not begin with the Arab Spring. It's very interesting. I haven't figured out why. But when I look at the data, I begin to see uh, uh, a substantial, statistically robust uh, rise in incidents of terrorism uh, and political violence more generally, starting around 2007, 2008. It, it doesn't start very sharply in most countries, but, but the, trend, the trend is there, and I can't explain it uh, yet. I, I hope to be able to explain it. I would love your ideas for why uh, we may begin to see the spike in political violence in the MENA region, uh, uh, not in 2011 or 2012, but uh, a little bit earlier, 2007, 2008, 2009. It's an enigma to me. I don't, I don't, un I don't understand it. But we've, before we get into the pathologies of the, of the, of the regional uh, uh, context, um, perhaps let's um, say a couple of words about the functioning international order, okay? the, the working world. Okay? This is what you know, Fukuyama or others would call the OECD world, right? The, the world that works. And in fact, much of the world does work. Uh, or at least has worked rather well for, for a prolonged period of time, what we call the long peace since the end of the Second World War until now. And, and then, of course, there's a question of whether we're beginning to see the disintegration of that long peace uh, in the international system now. I think that if we would have asked the European audience this time last year, are we beginning to see the end of the long peace? Most people in Europe would have said no. Uh, I wonder if the, the same answer would be, would be given today, given what we've seen uh, the waves of, you know, the, the externalities of the Syrian uh, civil war, the Libyan civil war, arriving on Europe's uh, shore, especially in the, last, in the last few months. But what I want to propose to you, I, when I talk to my students about this, I, I tell them that we can think about the international order, the liberal international order, the post-Second World War international order, if you like, as being sort of a two-layered cake. It's a very easy way to think about it, right? We have a Westphalian layer, that's been around for, for about 300 years. And then we have a Wilsonian layer sitting on, on top of it. Let me explain what I mean by that, right? We assume that the world, the functioning world, <coughs> is uh, 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 composed of sovereign functioning uh, uh, nation states that, um, uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. And on top of that, in those areas of the world that work, North America, Europe, uh, much of the some uh, much of the, the post-communist uh, space, especially those countries that have joined the European Union, uh, Asia, Latin America, um, um, and and to some degree, to some degree, uh, although less so, uh, parts of sub-Saharan Africa, really uh, have these two elements um, working reasonably well. Okay, we can analyze every region of the world. How robustly and deeply Westphalian is it? and how robustly and deeply Wilsonian uh, uh, it is. Okay, well, when I mean the Wilsonian order, I mean that on the top of this uh, foundational layer of state sovereignty, we have the spread of democracy, uh, economic interdependence, and international organizations and international law that sort of anchor this whole thing in, in, in place. And, and my argument, uh, or what, what I want to show you before, before I, I, I get into these aspects of the functioning international order, is that when we look globally, and if we look long term, at patterns of violence uh, around the world, as you can see from this graph, um, war is becoming rarer and rarer. War between states has almost entirely disappeared in the international system. And... Uh, at least until very recently, if you sat in North America, if you sat in Latin America, if you sat in Europe, and if you sat in most parts of, of Asia, and even sub-Saharan Africa, um, I, I think that um, your ex existence, your experience as a human being is one of, not only of the spread of democracy and rising wealth, but also uh, levels of, of violence, of war, civil war, etc., are, 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 going, are going down, okay? Uh, and I, that, I think, is a very, very important thing to, uh, to understand. Um, it's something that we Israelis, uh, it, it's a source of great frustration for us, right? When, I, when we talk about this uh, among, you know, in Israeli audiences, we, we, we talk about the loneliness of the fighting democracy, how we found ourselves as a sort of a, a democratic Wilsonian state living in a Hobbesian, in a Hobbesian neighborhood. 
and how frustrating it is for many Israelis who share the va these Wilsonian values to live in a neighborhood uh, that challenges us and that has not enjoyed the long peace and, and the spread of democracy, uh, economic interdependence, and all those good things that help us provide conditions of, 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 of security. But that's, that's an aside. Um, <coughs> I want to suggest to you that functioning cooperative statehood is really the foundation of this, of this, of this order. And I want to do this because in a moment we're going to get into the pathologies, right? We're going to get into, yes, you want to have a question? Yeah. a question to yeah. clarify. Yeah. So wars are becoming less and less prevalent. But right. Are, but similarly, is death as a result of conflict yes. becoming less prevalent? What you have in this graph is uh, world battle deaths between 1946 and 2014. So you see these waves, okay. right? But it's a little bit like the Dow Jones going in the wrong direction, <laughs> right? So you have these waves. But on the whole, the historical trend uh, uh, is, is towards peace, mm -hmm. OK? And, and so again, at least until recently, if you were a young European or a young person living in Latin America, especially people who were born after the military juntas and the, you know, after the big transition to democracy that Latin America experienced in the 1980s uh, and early 90s, um, you have very little experience with mass-scale <coughs> political violence, mm -hmm. uh, war, insurgency, civil war, and, and, and terrorism, okay? Yeah, my question is, what yeah. about violence, other kinds of violence, which is also politically motivated, right? No, well, fair enough. It would be considered a conflict, yeah. but... Uh, you mean, you mean terrorism? Also. Okay, so these, it's a good question. Um, all I wanted to do with this graph, uh, it's obviously... Uh, very sort of macro picture, etc. So it doesn't show nuances. Uh, these are these are world battle deaths. Okay, so th these are sort of, um, uh, if you like, sort of conventional war, Proper but wars. well, but also civil war, okay. uh, and what we call interstate, uh, uh, internationalized civil wars, which means uh, a non-state armed group fighting a state. Okay, and 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 there is nuance here because. Yes, we've seen this broad, uh, phenomenal decrease in, in, in large-scale violence. The category of conflict that we see in the international system that's actually on the rise, uh, especially in the last 15 years, is, is this phenomena of non-state armed groups fighting states. But that's the only sort of category of, 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 of uh, conflict that is actually on the rise. And that's interesting. Okay? And it's actually very relevant to our, to, to our discussion. Okay? Um, and, I'll, and I'll be happy to, to, we can talk one on one on more nuanced pictures of political violence and, and patterns, etc. Because I think it's very, very interesting. Um, but before we get into the, the pathologies and try to understand what's happening here in the region, I want to suggest to you these five dimensions of what we expect from the modern, the, the 21st century, the early 21st century uh, uh, state. This is something that Hobbes did not dream of in the late 17th century. It's probably something also that John Stuart Mill didn't think about in the, in the, in the, you know, in, in the, in the 19th century. But, but when we look at sort of uh, uh, what we assume the world to look like and what we need states to be able to do in order to manage uh, properly the international system, I want to suggest to you that there are essentially five uh, key, key dimensions. And the reason that I don't like to talk about failed states uh, is that, um, and prefer to, to sp speak about areas of limited statehood, is because I think that we can take each state in the world and analyze it on these five parameters. In a minute, I'll translate it into the pathologies and see that each state in the world does not fully uh, fulfill each one of these things. Uh, but also, when we look more specifically at North Africa and the Middle East, at the moment, we tend to focus on Syria, you know, Yemen, Somalia, uh, Iraq, Libya as being these failed states. But, as I'll show you in a moment, there is a deeper crisis of governance. Uh, in essence, almost all states in North Africa and the Middle East suffer to some degree, in some parameters, from very serious uh, 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 gaps uh, in security and capacity and legitimacy that I think we, we have to be very careful not to, not, not to ignore. But again, before we can get into the pathologies, I think it's important that we're on a level playing field conceptually in terms of... Uh, what's normal? What, what, what should we aspire to? This also becomes very relevant when we come to talk about policy, right? Where, where do we go from here? What do we expect from the, from the functioning modern state at the beginning of the 21st century? First and foremost, this is the sine qua non of statehood. Max Weber's famous definition of a state, 
It's a political entity that exercises a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence, control of violence and the management of violence and prevention of chaos is the sine qua non of, 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 of statehood. This was true for Hobbes, and it is true, it is true for, our, for us. Of course, this security has both a domestic dimension, right? We expect a centralized government to be able to control the entirety of its territory and its, its population and its borders, very, very important. But it also has an international component, which, again, Hobbes didn't really think about, but Grotius did, uh, which is... Um, that uh, a sovereign state is expected under international law to prevent the export of security threats from within its territory to other units surrounding it, i.e. other, other states. So there's, a, there's an internal component and an external component. The second thing we expect from the state is to be able to exercise at least reasonable administrative capacity to generate policy, to implement policy, and to enforce uh, uh, a policy. So there is an issue of capacity, state capacity, the ability of the state uh, uh, to exercise power. Okay. Uh, thirdly, legitimacy. We expect, and here people typically confuse the, the notion of legitimacy uh, or sort of bundle it into one thing, but it really means two things. The first thing uh, is that the state uh, commands, at the most fundamental way, the basic loyalty of its population, right? We want some kind of notion of citizenship, right? So that the, the, uh, no uh, political entity can uh, exercise power simply by coercion. We, we need the, co the cooperation of the population for the state to, to, to function, right? So we have to have some kind of notion uh, of loyalty to the state, uh, otherwise it disintegrates, number one. Secondly, and very, very importantly for, for the Middle East, the state in a way has to be supreme over other competing identities. So when push comes to shove, we expect a citizen of a state to obey the law of the government of that state, of the constitution of that state, as opposed to their own tribal leader, uh, religious leader, uh, uh, um, um, leader of, uh, of, uh, of, a, of an insurgency group, and, and so on and so forth, right? Now, we want legitimacy to be based on consensus, on consent, right? Uh, hopefully democracy. Uh, international law doesn't really uh, care whether that legitimacy or whether that uh, uh, authority comes from democracy or, or, or compulsion, but we expect this uh, uh, some degree of legitimacy for the state, okay? Fourthly, very importantly, uh, again, something that Hobbes didn't uh, think about, didn't, uh, didn't talk about very much, but it becomes more and more important, especially in the second half of the 20th century and at the beginning of the 21st century. We expect today from the state to provide at least essential public goods, law and order, but also infrastructure, health, education, uh, uh, markets, okay, protection of the environment, and there's a big debate of how much the state should do, should the state uh, interfere more, should it interfere less. Fukuyama, again, has this really nice kind of two-by-two two where he sort of says, look, we can put every country on the world in the world into sort of a box, of sort of a two-by-two two box. Does the state try to provide a lot of public service, uh, a lot of essential public goods or few public goods? Does it do it successfully or th does it do it not successfully, right? So I, as an Israeli citizen, think that the state of Israel tries to provide a lot of public goods, and it doesn't always do it very successfully. Uh, in that sense, I'd much rather be a Swede or a Norwegian or a, or a Canadian, okay? Uh, states that provide a lot of public goods and tend to do it very well. One of the big, 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 big problems of North African and the Middle Eastern states is that they either provide very few public goods, uh, typically not very, not, not very well, and in addition to that, the people's expectations of what the state should provide, given the fact that people now can look around the world and see how people live in other parts of the world, expectation, people's expectation of what the state should provide, I think has risen dramatically over the last 30, 40 uh, uh, years. First of all, through Al Jazeera and CNN, and now through the social, social networks, people's expectations of what the state should provide them. If you're a young Moroccan looking for a job, if you're a young Egyptian looking for a job, uh, 30, 40 years ago, it's not only that your father, your mother and father and your grandparents probably lived in the village rather than the city, and so had different expectations of life, but today you can instantaneously see how people live around the world, so your expectations of what the state should provide you have risen through the roof, and when the state does not provide you with those essential public goods, 
you are disappointed, you are disillusioned, perhaps you turn to other sources of authority for identity, for, for goods, for protection, and so on and so forth. Last but not least, uh, and um, this is something that I'm actually, I haven't seen in the literature, it's something that I want to develop in writing, is this notion of collaborative sovereignty. I think it's fair to say that in a globalized world of, of, eco, of, of, of interdependence, not just economic interdependence, <coughs> But interdependence in terms of fighting organized crime and disease and refugees and international terrorism, we expect states uh, not only to control their own borders and not allow external actors to disrupt and to be able to infiltrate their uh, so-called Westphalian sovereignty, right? Uh, uh, there is an expectation that uh, Iran will not be able to set up military bases in countries uh, around, around the region, just to use a sort of a stark example. But also we expect states to have the capacity and the will to work together to address cross-border problems. Um, and, and I think that at the beginning of the 21st century, these are the foundations of the, of the working, the functioning international order, the liberal international order, okay? What I want to suggest to you, just in a sentence, is that the MENA region was never Wilsonian, never ever Wilsonian. We never had a Wilsonian layer in the Middle East. No democracy. You can see this. These, these are pre, this is 2010 figures, pre-Arab Spring. You can see the distribution, the percentage of countries in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, across the world, uh, of uh, both electoral democracies and liberal democracies. This is just as an illustration, because I could talk to you about economic interdependence, I can talk about international law and international integration. Um, if you look at each one of these three dimensions of the Wilsonian Triangle, the Middle East never had it. No democracy, no economic interdependence between Arab states themselves, never mind the boycott of Israel. Arab states don't trade with, 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 with one another. And certainly, we have not seen levels of in, uh, regional integration in the Middle East in the way that we have seen in Europe, uh, in North America, or even in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. Very weak regional integration. So the Middle East was never Wilsonian. And what I want to suggest to you, that it was only briefly Westphalian. Uh, and now, the, the big question, and when I say briefly Westphalian, I really mean essentially between 1956 and maybe 2010, okay? Since the end of the age of empire and colonialism in the Middle East, the rise of Arab nationalism that kind of uh, at least had the ostensible uh, institutional uh, uh, trappings of a Westphalian order until the beginning of the disintegration that we see here in the last, in the, in the last several years, okay? And, and what I want to su uh, suggest to you is that when we look, and again, I, I'm unfortunately, uh, I can't get into this in, in huge amount of detail, but when we look, for example, at the failed state index, the fragile state index, uh, if we look at the top 20 list of failed states in the world today, um, um, that's, a, that's one top 20 list that you really don't want to be on, okay? Uh, more and more we see uh, uh, Levant, uh, Middle Eastern, and North African states making it into that top top 20 lists of, 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 of failed states. I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. I tried to look at this at sort of a, 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 high, a slightly higher resolution, looking at World Bank uh, figures that are quite good figures on governance. Again, these are sort of still unpublished uh, findings. I looked at this criterion of government effectiveness uh, and looked at different regions of the world. What you see in the red uh, up there, that's the OECD world, right? So high levels of, of government uh, effectiveness uh, scores. And what you see down here is uh, um, the, 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 the bottom line in the purple, I'm sorry it's not very clear with the projector, is Sub-Saharan Africa. What you see in the blue line in the middle, the one that dips, you see why I said it begins sort of in 2008? Uh, the one that sort of dips uh, rather substantially, these, these are huge changes, okay? Uh, is, is, the MENA, is the MENA region. So uh, we, we, we are beginning to see a sort of a crisis of governance, and we see this also in rule of law, uh, rule of law conditions. You see here uh, the Middle East never very strong on, on the rule of law, protection uh, of you know, anti, anti uh, um, uh, of, of human security and, uh, and judicial independence and, and things of that, of that nature. But we see again, starting in about 2009, uh, a really sharp dip 
in the scores of, of, the, of the rule of law. So before the Arab Spring, uh, and now the Middle East really has the lowest rule of law uh, scores regionally in the, in, the, in, in the world. We see a similar thing when we look at control of corruption. You see the Middle East uh, in, in the year 2000 uh, being slightly higher even than Latin America in terms of its scores and uh, uh, deteriorating uh, uh, today having, again, the lowest uh, scores on control of corruption uh, uh, in, the, in, in the world as a, as a, as a region. Of course, we, we can also look at, uh, at this on a level of an individual state and, and so on and so forth. But this is just to illustrate a sort of a crisis of governance in this part of the world that, again, very interestingly, doesn't begin in sort of the post-Arab Spring, but sort of precedes it at least, at least uh, somewhat, okay? What I want to suggest, uh, therefore, so if we know what the, what the functioning international order kind of looks like, let's begin to sort of analyze the pathologies, and I'll very quickly end with some, with some questions. I want, to, I want to suggest to you that we should be thinking about uh, the fact that the dominant trend in the last five, seven, eight years in North Africa and the Middle East has not been democratization, as we all hoped. Let me just say as an aside, as an Israeli, I would want nothing better than to live in a neighborhood of consolidated liberal democracies, because that's the best guarantee of my own security and the security of my neighbors, the, the welfare of my neighbors. I think that's the best guarantor for, for peace and security and stability, okay? Uh, but unfortunately, we have not seen hopes of, demo of rapid democratization materialize, but neither have we seen transition from all types of stable authoritarianism into new types of stable authoritarianism. I think that the, the real dominant dynamic, it's not the only dynamic, but it's the dominant dynamic in this region in the last, uh, again, five, seven, ten years, it, 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 you know, it's difficult to sort of place it entirely, is this proliferation of areas of, 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 uh, of limited statehood and the emergence of these gaps, okay? Security gaps, of course, capacity gaps, legitimacy gaps, human well-being gaps, by this I mean, you know, uh, refugees, internally displaced persons, poverty, uh, etc. I just saw a report uh, about a week ago that the only region in the world where levels of carbon emission are dropping rapidly, uh, it's, it's uh, the Middle East. So we're probably going to get a, a medal from the UN or the Kyoto Protocols for reducing levels of, uh, you know, uh, CO2 uh, emissions into the world. But of course, that's, that's, that's a sign of, of total economic stagnation and, uh, and, and, and some kind of economic uh, collapse. It's, it's not uh, uh, the outcome of, of wise uh, environmental, environmental policy. So uh, a huge drop in human well-being and this collaborative sovereignty gap, which is causing us uh, a growing inability of states in the region to effectively cooperate to address cross-border problems. So we're moving from this, now I believe that this never truly existed in the Middle East. This, is a, this, this was always something of a, an Alice in Wonderland uh, uh, um, um, fantasy. But it's a fantasy that we managed to, so ma to maintain for about 50 or 60 years. It's an historical an anomaly. It never truly existed, but, but it's sort of, we could pretend that, it, that, that this Westphalian order existed here uh, for some time. But we're moving increasingly towards this, okay? And if we sort of zoom into Syria and Iraq, and, and Jonathan knows this arena much better. You'll probably tell me that this is already, you know, out of date and <laughs> inaccurate. But 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 you get you get the point. We're we're moving into a, a a very different kind of international order. Okay, let me finish on some series of questions which I want to uh, uh, challenge the uh, the panelists on, uh, but also to get you thinking about about these uh, about these issues. Okay, um, the first the first question that comes up here, I think, is you know how robust or fragile are those remaining uh, MENA states that are still kind of standing. And of course, as an Israeli, I'm particularly worried about Jordan um, and, uh, and, and, and Lebanon, uh, most, most immediately. Uh, some would say Egypt, some would say even Saudi Arabia and Morocco. Uh, but how robust, you know, and how can we evaluate? Do we have good enough uh, models to evaluate regime stability, state stability or vulnerability? Uh, there was a theory that was floating around in the aftermath of, you know, the outbreak of the, the Arab Spring, that monarchies are actually more stable than Ba'athist uh, Arab regimes. Perhaps they enjoy greater, uh, greater legitimacy, etc. Is this true, or is this just a statistical, you know, uh, kind of an accident of history? Is oil wealth a guarantor of regime survival and stability, or, or is it not? Uh, does oil wealth give uh, a, a regime 
capacities of co-optation and repression that oil poor countries don't have. And if that's the case, how do we explain Libya, which is of course a very oil rich uh, country, uh, but, but collapsed, right? Uh, so we have, a, you know, questions around this, these notions of regime stability, instability, where do we go from here? A related but separate question is this question of systemic fluidity, okay? How much systemic fluidity really exists in the region? And we had a big debate about this in the Herzliya conference several, several months ago, where some people, such as Stephen Krasner and Kenneth Pollock, uh, said, look, essentially, the, the big tsunami of state failure in the Middle East is kind of behind us. The rest of the states that are, that are here are essentially robust. And, um, you know, uh, ISIS has basically exhausted the spaces that it can really, that can, it, it can really exploit. There are others who believe that that, that is perhaps uh, somewhat uh, overly optimistic. And the, actually, the degree of systemic fluidity, if you like, uh, is greater than, uh, than that. By the way, systemic fluidity does not only mean areas that could be uh, taken over by ISIS. It also means the possibility of emergence of new states. We've had Sudan split into two states in 2010. Good. The Kurdish issue, of course, is, is critical in this, in this regard. Uh, uh, but also how permanent or how ephemeral is the rule of non-state armed groups that are now trying to establish themselves as, as caliphates, right? Uh, is this sustainable? Can, can they do it in, 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 the, in the long run? Can they really uh, uh, create non-Westphalian types of, of political organization? This is what I call non-state armed governors. Okay? So it's not just your conventional non-state non -state actors, but these are non-state actors that have ideological, organizational, uh, uh, and other aspirations to actually form non-Westphalian types of states. Okay? Um, Okay, so uh, the, the third question, uh, you know, uh, is, is the one that I've just, uh, I've just, uh, I've just articulated. Uh, related to this is, you know, how much state does it take to sort of fend off uh, uh, a, a group like uh, ISIS and, or, or Hezbollah? Two very, very different groups, of course, right? But just as states are not sort of uniform, neither are non-state armed groups. And uh, we can kind of think about these non-state armed groups as being on a, on a, on a continuum. But the, the, the big point here is that you will not have, presumably, an organization like ISIS emerge and become entrenched in a reasonably strong state like Turkey or Indonesia uh, uh, or, or Egypt or perhaps you know, even most of Nigeria, right? Uh, so far, at least, we've had groups like ISIS manage to entrench themselves in, in regions of chaos uh, and in you know, places where we have huge security capacity, legitimacy gaps, uh, etc. Uh, but how much state does it really take uh, to resist the rise of these kinds of groups? And if the state cannot provide governance, then, then who, who can, okay? Um, and, and here I'm going to last three, three, three questions for our panelists and for, and for you. Um, Areas of limited statehood, you know, just as nature does not tolerate a vacuum, the international system does not tolerate a vacuum. Where the state recedes, other political actors will come and try to fill, fill the vacuum. And what has happened is that these areas of limited statehood become what I call arenas of governance contestation, arenas of competition for territorial control, control of resources, oil, money, uh, economic activity, but also population, hearts and minds. Um, uh, state actors, such as particularly Iran, have become very, uh, I think, um, capable in exploiting porous borders and the inability of state authorities to, to police and control their own, their own territory and their own borders. Um, I think Syria is a, is a great example of that. Uh, I, I don't think that if, if uh, Assad had effective sovereignty over Syria, he would have allowed the degree to which the Iranians are exploiting his territory and his, his resources, okay? Because it doesn't serve his national interest. But he doesn't have any, any control over this any, anymore, limited control. But we're also beginning to see that other My state actors, uh, uh, Russia, Turkey, are entering into this governance contestation game, and we're beginning to see these kind of multiple 
uh, uh, competitions for control that are both local, regional, but also, but also international, okay? Um, what can we say about that and the potential uh, for, um, uh, for especially anti-Western states to exploit uh, these new opportunities for proxy building, et cetera, that we see the Iranians having done so effectively in Iraq, uh, in Syria, uh, in, in, in Yemen, of course, and, and Lebanon, okay? Now I move towards policy. Uh, if, if this is the reality and we accept it, and I, again, I, I invite you to, to challenge this and to add to it and to, uh, uh, to, to offer uh, competing analyses, but if this is uh, partly, uh, you know, a generally accurate story, uh, particularly post-Afghanistan and Iraq, I think that the, the feeling in the West, as Michael Oren likes to say, American Motima Baita, right? Americans don't want to be involved in the Middle East. Um, they have enough domestic issues of their own. Uh, there's the famous pivot towards, uh, towards Asia. Uh, there is uh, far less uh, oil dependency uh, for the United States on the Middle East. Uh, we're not going to see large-scale state-building exercises, large-scale expeditionary counterinsurgency campaigns here, I think, by the only Western power that can really possibly do it, which is the United States, right? Uh, I don't think Europe has any appetite or capacity to, to, to do this type of thing. So if we're not going to see state building and large-scale counterinsurgency campaigns, you know, what, what do we do in this, uh, in this environment? What, what political, uh, international, I don't want to even use the word solution, but management strategy do we have for, for this reality? Do we go back to conventional counterterrorism, where we're basically focused on killing the mosquitoes rather than drying the swamp? Do we develop some kind of new containment strategy to try to contain areas of chaos and somehow kind of manage them? Uh, what, what do we do? Where do we go, where do we go from here, okay? Um, is the current coalition uh, strategy against ISIS, is that a potential model? And I deliberately put that in, you know, in inverted commas because, uh, I, 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 well, you know, so far at least I don't think it's, it's, it's proving to be a very, very successful model, but perhaps I'm wrong. Uh, and, and finally, um, and because I'm Israeli, I'm always optimistic. You need to be an optimist to live in this country. You always look for the silver lining. Uh, are there new opportunities in this otherwise rather grim uh, regional uh, picture? Um, one of the things that we're starting to toy with is this idea that perhaps we are seeing the beginnings of the emergence, or at least a, a desire, the possibility for the emergence of what I would call sort of an axis of stability, uh, a convergence of interests between the United States, Europe, but also those countries in the Middle East, uh, like Israel, like Jordan, like Egypt, that are essentially interested in maintaining the Westphalian order, in maintaining uh, uh, state, uh, state stability, versus what I would call sort of an axis of chaos, right? Not an axis of evil, but an axis of chaos that has deep vested interest in uh, flaring uh, uh, conflict and civil war um, for a range of, of political goals, whether it's Iran that is trying to extend its uh, regional influence or uh, radical Salafist uh, groups that have a radically different vision uh, of, of politics, of human nature, of, of human society. Do we see the possibility of the emergence of, of new alliances, new relationships to try to stabilize the situation or at least manage it in, in, in some form? And now, um, um, number one, I've taken up way too much time, <laughs> uh, but I hope I've, I've provided uh, some, uh, uh, some, uh, some challenges. Uh, and let, let's open it up to the, uh, to the, um, uh, to the panel, then we uh, open it up to, uh, to, to conversation. We have, as I said, quite, quite a bit of time. Um, first of all, it's my, really my distinguished uh, uh, you know, pr pleasure to, uh, to welcome uh, Germany's new ambassador to, to Israel, who's been here six, six weeks, um, Ambassador Dr. Clemens von, von Gotze, um, who um, has an MA in history and a doctorate in law from the University of uh, Erlangen. Erlangen, is that pronounced that correctly? Uh, he's an extremely experienced uh, diplomat, 
from 2006 until 2009, he served as the ambassador uh, um, to the permanent representation to the European Union uh, and was part of the EU's political and security uh, committee during this time. Uh, previously, he has served as the uh, director general to the office of the federal president for the, for the, and the head of the uh, foreign affairs department. And uh, between 2012 and 2015, uh, Ambassador von Gotze was the uh, Director General to the Federal Foreign uh, Office um, on, on Africa, Asia, Latin America, uh, and, the, and the Middle East, so the sort of the global south. And uh, he will address us on the crisis and order in a globalized world, the geopolitical forces shaping uh, the MENA region. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Again. Um, we, we, we had some extent uh, theoretical thoughts already, so I don't have to uh, maybe too theoretical in, in my approach uh, in, in my remarks. I would, uh, I would come back to some of the questions that, that you have um, raised um, and, and maybe um, try to answer them in, in my way and, and maybe in some points would like to contradict uh, slightly uh, some, some of your um, some of your remarks. First of all, I think it's, it's not by chance that the developments that you have so well described happened over the last uh, decade mainly, or over the last 15 years. I think what we have to take into account that major changes in international policy have always happened when there was uh, an energy revolution or a communications revolution. Um, and we have a communications revolution now with a complete di digital change and with what we call the globalization, so a, a very profound um, change in the economic act activities in the world, a, a ever closer uh, economic uh, co connex and um, communication uh, connex between the different um, parts of the world. Um, what does that mean? In former times, um, these kind of revolutions led to the rise of more powerful states than others, um, and they have been able to acquire large empires. I, I would say that would, was in a nutshell what happened in the past. Um, what we see in the last years, and you have described that very well, is that uh, the digital revolution is undermining statehood and is weakening it. Um, and that's, that's why we see a, a rise of non-state actors, a rise of non-state violence, and this uh, phenomenon of, of failed states. And that is something where we have to profoundly change our, our foreign policy approach to. It is not primarily, as you well described, it's not primarily a question of encountering very strong state actors uh, and preventing them to, from taking over their neighbors or invading other territories. It's more the question that the digital revolution is undermining states and that we have to try everything to keep these states functioning in order to prevent terrorists from using the vacuum that's created and then threatening us from, from, that, from that area. Maybe some few remarks. Why, why is it the case that, that the digital revolution um, uh, undermine states. I think you have made the, the major points already. People see through the internet, even at the most remote places in Earth, what's happening elsewhere. Um, and they get very much more aware of the inefficiency of their own governments um, than, and their own upper classes often. It's not only the governments, it's also uh, non-state uh, uh, organizations, tribes, and so on that, that uh, uh, do not function to the profit, really, of the lower layers of the society, and they get more and more aware of it, uh, and they protest against it. Um, and it's mainly, and maybe that is also a very important aspect for the, for the Middle East region, it's mainly states that are multi-ethnic and multi-religious that are threatened. Because other states, uh, states that have only one language, one ethnicity, a long historical um, uh, trace back into history, they have other factors of legitimacy. Um, Multi-ethnic, relatively new states that have not a strong national bond, um, they need efficiency because what is the other bond that binds the population of these countries together? And if their governments prove to be completely inefficient, then there is nothing left to keep the country together and it easily explodes at, at whatever political crisis occurs um, in these uh, countries. 
At, at the same time, I, I think we see also that the digital revolution leads to a strong shift uh, in power in the world. Um, so we have rising new states. It's not only the crisis part of it. It's not only that, that uh, uh, weak states uh, would be threatened by terrorism or power vacuum. It's all at the same time, we have a new power competition. And although this power competition has not led to wars, as you very right, by what you very rightly described, it, it leads to stronger competition. And it's very clear, and that would be my, my third um, uh, remark, it is very clear that these new states are not in the same way willing to integrate into a Wilsonian US-dominated or Soviet-dominated, as it was in the past, order. So there is no uh, appetite for the rising powers in the world, China, India, Brazil, and others, um, to integrate into a new Wilsonian power, a new Wilsonian order, where they feel it binds them again to a position they are just uh, overcoming. Um, so they feel they have been um, uh, subdued uh, in the past by an order that was not completely to their profit, but an order that was to the profit of the Europeans and the North Americans. And they more strongly re want to return to Westphalian order. And there, I think, the, su the, the two um, factors, on the one side, weak areas of failed statehood, I would call them failed statehood because that's what it is, and new emerging powers often combine because the new emerging powers or powers that strive to be uh, big powers again, and Iran, I think, is a very good example of that, um, they use um, terrorist forces, they use power vacuum, they try to expand their influence into these areas that are left open by states that are no longer uh, efficient or have never really been efficient, but it's so obvious now that, uh, that they that don't enjoy the legitimacy of their own uh, populations. And I think that's what we are, what we are seeing in, in, in the Middle East um, very strongly. So we have a combination of interstate power struggle um, using vacuum um, that is created by, by uh, weak uh, statehood. And um, maybe a last aspect on, on, on the very um, theoretical part I, I, I wanted to present here. Um, it is a question why do populations um, go into a situation where um, they support um, forces that tear their countries apart. I mean, if you look at Syria, it's, it's quite uh, amazing to see that these countries fall apart in an enormous amount of violence that cannot be uh, in the interest of any of the uh, different ethnic or religious groups in Syria. But people nevertheless uh, enter into that vicious circle, um, and maybe we come back to the Westphalian order. I mean, the Westphalian order ended that same kind of crisis in, in, middle, uh, in, in Central Europe uh, in the 17th century, where also um, populations, different political forces, have gone against each other in a very bloody, completely devastating civil war. And I recall that in the Thirty Years' War, um, uh, more than one-third of the German population um, uh, was killed. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a, also a very bloody affair that had to be ended only um, after a, a complete exhaustion. And it was, by the way, the same combination of complete weakness within the center of Europe and outside powers as France, Sweden, and others that struggled in that area over, uh, over influence. So why do people um, uh, accept that kind of chaos happening? Um, my interpretation is that it has also to do with the um, digital revolution that we are seeing. Because the digital revolution, um, on the one hand, um, takes down borders. So people can lifetime see what's going on in China, what's going on in Chile, or wherever. So you can follow up events all over the world, and the, the natural reaction should be, oh yes, I feel uh, connected with the rest of the world, so my own small environment is not that important anymore. I'm uh, a cosmopolitan uh, man, a human being, and, and it doesn't matter that much where I come from and what my history. But what happens is exactly the opposite. Um, this globalization and, and this overwhelming 
um, information flow makes people rather insecure about their own identity. And they return back to rather small groups, to their tribe, to their family, to their own language. Um, and we see that, by the way, not only in the Middle East or in, in areas of, uh, of the world that, that are less rich. I think it happens also in what you described as the OECD world. So if you look um, uh, to, to even European countries, People are nowadays, I would say, much more aware of their local ru roots, of uh, their own dialect, of uh, their own history. So what we see is a, is a with withdrawal into cozy, nice uh, uh, surroundings that you can really re rely on. Because you have f the feeling, if I'm really a cosmopolitan, uh, where do I really belong to? Who protects me in the end in this rather insecure world? Um, can I really trust all over the world? No, I can only trust the people I really know in my immediate environment. So we have a, a communications revolution connecting you to, the, to all parts of the world. But emotionally, we have uh, a situation where very many, very many people go back to their very, very small uh, groups in their immediate um, environment. And that explains also why legitimacy for, for governments um, uh, is reduced more, more and more. Um, on a quite different level, but uh, I think in a comparable way, you see that in, in many industrial countries, rich countries, every election brings about a, a government change because people have a strong tendency of being uh, discontent with what the government produces for them. They have the feeling, oh yes, okay, this and that um, area of politics might have been successful, but I can see in the internet, in TV, that there are other countries that are much more um, successful in that field where uh, my government is not successful, so I want to be uh, better off also. In that respect, so I hope to change government and, and uh, achieve better results from that. So it, it creates a constant uh, dissatisfaction with uh, what your own government uh, produces for you. Um, and that for democracies, there is a way out because you elect another, another government, you go for another party and give them four years or five years time and then maybe you elect the next one. Uh, so all loyalties to parties, for example, in, in Germany disappear very strongly. A hundred years ago, people would vote for the Social Democrats, whatever happened, yeah. uh, because their father was already a Social Democrat and their grandfather, and others would vote for Christian Democrats, whatever happened. This has completely disappeared. So the, the parties have to struggle for their constituencies at every election, and they, uh, they move from one uh, ideology uh, to, to the other. Um, but that means um, that in the end it's really it's economic efficiency, social efficiency that counts and those governments who cannot provide it are uh, endangered and they are lethally endangered often if they are autocrats and I think you also described that very well. An autocrat who is powerful enough to, to crush his own people can survive this kind of dissatisfaction. An autocrat that has only a very weak layer of uh, power and only a weak control of the, of the country does more and more uh, depend on uh, the people following him deliberately. And if that disappears, then the, the discontent will, will break up even uh, more violently. And, and that's exactly what I, I think what we have seen in Syria. Syria has not been a, a mainly and purely political revolution. It was, a, it was a, a, a revolt against a completely inefficient system that profited only a rather small group of the uh, society and, uh, by the way, also an ethnically defined group, and people were not willing to accept that uh, anymore. I mean, if people in Syria had known 2011 what would have happened four years later, maybe many of them would have been willing to tolerate that, that regime very much longer. But once you are in this movement into chaos, it's very difficult, unfortunately, to stop it, as we, as we have all, um, all seen. So last points from, from my inside, um, what can we do? Uh, I mean, what, what does it mean, uh, this, this analysis that I've presented, that on the one hand, um, new powers arise, and on the other hand, uh, important parts of the world, and particularly here in the region, fall in, into chaos. I think the first is we have to set ourselves very realistic aims. I think we have been... Uh, overjoyful uh, in, in the beginning of the 90s that after the Cold War um, we would be able to reinstate a real worldwide Wilsonian order accepted by everybody, the order of democracy, human rights, um, 
and international cooperation, I think we have to be uh, aware that this will not happen soon. Um, and, uh, we, um, and we have to see that um, we take systems, as, first of all, as, as they are. And we don't, uh, in, and if we meet systems that are already overstretched, that already suffer from a lack of legitimacy, that we don't overstretch them necessarily uh, further and do not um, uh, create uh, chaotic situations by, by goodwill to, to see countries develop very strong in, into democracies. That does not mean that I would ever say we should give up the aim of uh, democracy and human rights as a, a, an objective to achieve in the long run, but we have to be very well aware that democracy and, and human rights uh, need a lot of conditions on the ground, social conditions that have to be created first, social conditions, economic conditions, political conditions that have to be created for first um, before we, we ask countries, for example, to go uh, into hasty elections that have proven to be uh, very difficult uh, often when we try to, to rush things um, uh, too much. Um, we have to avoid these power vacua that are filled by terrorists. And it means wherever these power uh, vacua exist, um, we have to prevent the terrorists from going in. I think that's a very clear lesson that we have to learn now from the spread of ISIS. Um, if, if we don't fight them in Iraq and in Syria, they will expand further, and then it will be very difficult to control them uh, later. Um, we have to see that these new um, rising powers, as China, India, Brazil, um, and others in, in also in the region here, that we uh, try to convince them to act um, at least in a responsible way and, if possible, act together with us. So we have to take them into account because otherwise um, um, they might use their influence and their power in, in a way that we don't uh, uh, feel is helpful. So um, we have to go outside the OECD world and talk with others. Um, uh, that is not always easy. and. Um, you, you mentioned that I've been covering more, more or less three quarters of the world for, for the German foreign ministry in the last three and a half years. We have a lot of partners in the world that are difficult. And nevertheless, we have to talk to them when they have influence. It is much better that they use their influence in a way that we regard to be positive than ignoring them and then seeing that their influence is nevertheless there and, and we have to um, live with it. Um, we have to... Um, see that our develop development and cooperation takes more into account uh, the real wishes of the countries that we are dealing with. So um, uh, trying to um, influence countries from outside by saying, yeah, look, this has worked perfectly in a central European society, so why don't just apply it 100% and it will work, work in your place? I think that is a method that, has, that obviously has failed, and, and we have to see that we support those tendencies in certain countries that are really homegrown and that we can make them um, uh, be successful, but, but never try to, to just um, prescribe things from, from outside. Um, we have to minimize uh, uh, negative external factors, um, and um, we have, um, and, and I think that will be my, my very last uh, remark, um, we have to um, be aware that the world will remain very imperfect, um, so don't, don't always go for the, for the very best um, solution, and particularly, I think, in the, in the Middle East, um, we will have, live, have to live with a rather un, an imperfect situation for, for quite some time. Um, and the, the Germans now and the Europeans are, are feeling the repercussions of um, uh, the Middle Eastern problem very strongly by the enormous influx of migrants we are having in, in, in Europe at this stage. Uh, not all, but many of them coming from, from this region, particularly from, from Syria. And it will make it very well aware um, that Europe is affected, Europe needs to act, but it needs a long uh, haul uh, to tackle these problems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ambassador uh, von Gotze, for defensive realism, <laughs> I guess, and uh, pragmatism and uh, uh, reduced expectations about the ability to uh, to spread the Wilsonian order um, um, 
is your is your is your perspective. Um, I want to now um, invite our uh, dear friend, um, who's really become part of the IDC family and the ICT family, uh, Ambassador Dimitar uh, Mikhailov, uh, the Bulgarian ambassador here in uh, in Israel. Um, Dimitar is a real expert on, on on the Middle East and particularly on Syria, as you will you will see in a moment. He uh, graduated from the Arabic language department of Damascus University of 1989. Since then, he has served in embassies in Bulgaria, in Tripoli, Kuwait, Washington. Uh, from 2002 to 2004, he served as the head of the Iraq, Yemen, and Arab Gulf state section uh, of his uh, country's uh, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, I think most uh, interestingly uh, for, for, for us, before uh, having, having him come here to Israel, he served uh, in 2011, 2012, uh, as Bulgaria's ambassador in Syria itself in, uh, in, in, in Damascus until he was declared persona non grata by the, uh, by the regime. Uh, and since then, he's been here uh, in Israel, much to, to, our, to our delight. Uh, those of you who follow these things, you will see his, his uh, writing and his speaking. Uh, he's, he speaks uh, not only Bulgarian, of course, but also English and Arabic and Hebrew and, and Russian. Um, and he will address us on the topic of conceptualizing the geopolitical transformation of the Middle East, uh, past, present, and possible uh, futures. Dimitar, it's great, always great to have you uh, with us. Sit here so you have some more, some more thank, thank you, Mihai, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. It's a Sisyphean work to conceptualize <laughs> all this immense material, and I decided to go to flashpoints uh, in five panels. We'll jump over flashpoint, 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 till we come to my conclusions, Maskanochri, to have something that, uh, because one of the one of the observations, my observations, is gradually, with uh, excellent, the excellent work of uh, Mikhail, we'll get lost in translation. We'll get lost in this vast and huge uh, Middle East mass. First, a perspective of historian, a methodological, if you will. I am tempted on many occasions to compare Sunni Shia Quash with precisely the Thirty Years' War, the Westphalian treaties. I am tempted to, the, the, uh, to compare the events with what happened in the Western Balkans, disintegration of Yugoslavia, an artificial sort of state with artificial states in the Middle East. And as a historian, I look back to the history of Islam and I see, for instance, the middle of the 10th century, the, the Caliph is uh, absolutely losing all his power. The Buayid family, by the way, Shia family is taking over Baghdad. And we have almost the same situation. But what I want to stress here is that we are facing a situation that is sui generis. We shouldn't be tempted so much to compare because each historical situation is unique. It bears resemblance to, to other historical situations, but we are certainly in place of time in a sui generis situation. Very briefly, I would like to jump over as milestones all these main factors that led to, to the current situation. Of course, fall of the Ottoman Empire, this integration of the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire, and then, of course, from Sykes-Picot to San Remo, you have a, a gov government engineering by, by France and uh, Great Britain, and then uh, we have imposing something artificial on an area that was... Uh, most of uh, from uh, 1517 was part of the Ottoman Empire, divided to Vilets and Sanjaks, and suddenly we have states. Then, after the end of colonial period, we have artificial new states. Then we have uh, attempts to introduce liberal models, but uh, all these attempts are not very successful. Even I, I remember that in Iran and Egypt, sometimes introducing liberal economic models went to the strengthening of the conservative reactionary religious forces. And of course, we have to mention the earthquakes by the end of the 70s, the Iranian revolution, the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan. Uh, of course, Camp David agreement uh, was sort of game changer. And afterwards, we have to mention the end of bipolar 
bipolar uh, system with the demise of the Soviet Union, most of all socio-demographical changes. Egypt uh, some 3,000 uh, years ago during the 25th family was 2 million. Now it will hit 100 million. I, I was in Cairo. I saw 20 million polis with almost no functional uh, ability to, to, to be sustained. Then, ladies and gentlemen, I briefly, uh, what my German colleague mentioned, uh, I, would, I would like to put a stress on informational technologies and digital revolution. For me, it started in 1996 with the launching of Jazeera. I am watching Jazeera since 1998, and I can tell you that on several occasions, Arab, different Arab states were on the brink of severing uh, relations with Qatar, Libya, uh, Jordanian monarchy, Saudis, because of Jazeera. So Jazeera replaced the old BBC London. Everybody was listening before that to BBC London. But this was a very different discourse and challenged the minds of the Arab population. <laughs> then I went trying to construct my, my uh, presentation to you. I remembered an article of Bernard Lewis, The Muslim Rage, he has written this article in 1990. And I came to the conclusion that we are witnessing internalizing of the Muslim rage. Uh, as Samihai mentioned, I served in Libya. And as a young diplomat, an ambassador assigned to me to translate all the speeches of the great uh, and late leader Muammar Gaddafi. It was crazy. But through that, I discovered how skillful he was precisely to manipulate a society, basically a Bedouin Berber Arab society, and to externalize internal pressures. But now through digital revolution, through all these new technologies, Jazeera, Arabia, we have internalization of, of the Muslim, Muslim rage or, or the discontent of the people. And then sitting in my home, I remembered also Tom Friedman with his 10 uh, uh, ten flatteners. Tom Friedman is fascinated with uh, technology, uploading, downloading, and he mentioned only one political flattener of globalization, and this is the end of the Berlin Wall. But now, I believe you agree with me, we are witnessing the clash of the tectonic place between the Middle East and Europe. And this is another flattener which should be taken into consideration. Third panel or third part as far as security is being concerned and the remark of uh, Mihai uh, about, about the, the precise time when uh, we are witnessing this uh, intensification of, of violence, I do believe that it started by the end of the 90s uh, with, the formation, with, with the formation of this global jihadi front of Ayman Zawahiri and Osama bin Laden and then we have uh, Dar es Salaam, Nairobi Bombing. So, in my point of view, it, it, it goes back to the 90s, the beginning of, uh, uh, probably the, the reason why is that the Salafi Jihadi Takfiri theory crystallized and they became global. Uh, they became with, with clear global targets. Okay. So this is for the past. Trying to look at the present and the future. If we observe the area, I would suggest that we, we find three systems. By systems, I mean not a state with its apparatus, but rather a system of, of mechanisms, ideology, that operate in, in the area. The, of course, the first one is the Iranian Shia, Velayateh Fakih system that has a regional impact and regional ability to affect and change the area. The second one is the Jihadi Salafi Takfiri uh, system represented by, by the Islamic State. Relatively, uh, in, by the way, yesterday uh, Ayman Zawahiri uh, gave a new, new statement that this is not, this is a take over, over Emirate without any legitimacy. Uh, but nevertheless, it is there. And on the other hand, you have the classical. <laughs> the moderate, so to say, Al-Qaeda structures. But uh, especially the, the Islamic State, uh, as viewed, viewed as a system, they have the ability to, to a regional impact, 
the ability to construct or to, to, to produce impact in different areas. And finally, we have different Sunni factors, but this is not a homogeneous system. Rather, we have different nuances. For instance, we have assertive, nostalgic Turkish uh, Sunni uh, system. If the trend in the current elections will, will continue, we have preventive Sunni model in the Gulf states, which I would include in MENA, by the way, because they are integral part. We have irredentist sort of uh, Sunni, Sunni model in Iraq. But one way or the other, if we, we look at the Syrian opposition uh, right now in the northern Syria, we will see all these factors, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, helping the rebels. So we, have, we, we see this, this Sunni system working on the spot. These are, in my humble opinion, the three systems. And now I will challenge you with different concepts and, and doctrines that are shaping the future of governance and the political structures of the area. The first one I, I mentioned is the, the, the harsh sectarian confrontation, and I have written an article about that between Sunni and Shia. Since the, the time of uh, Fatimite Caliphate, we don't witness such a, a, a clash between Sunni and Shia. Of course, Ottoman Empire and Safavid Empire fault, but these were imperial clashes. This is purely on, on the ideological extreme uh, Wahhabi Salafi from one hand and extreme Shia on, on the other hand, which is galvanizing the area and is posing, and I uh, completely agree with my German colleague, that future is bleak. We hope for the best and plan for the worst. Second idea I challenge you is that whatever will happen in the area, there will be no zero-sum game. Uh, and we are witnessing that in Syria. In 2012, I've, I have written to Sofia that, that it, it will be a prolonged conflict because, because the powers have their limits and they cannot extend. Uh, yesterday, Gutierrez said that humanitarian crisis uh, cannot be solved with uh, humanitarian solutions, he said. Uh, it, it is a political solution that, that is needed to, to the crisis to be so, solved. But it is not a political, it's a military solution, because we are seeing that in Yemen. In Yemen, uh, the Houthis will sit on the table only in the moment they are defeated and they feel that they can no longer sustain uh, the internal clash they have with, with uh, the Sunni uh, Yemeni forces. Uh, and, of course, uh, it will come to sort of, and we were talking with Jonathan, a war of attrition. It, it's a conflict that, that, that goes to, to, ability, to ability of each side, whoever is involved in this conflict, to prolong and to fight. And we are seeing that very clearly in the Syrian conflict. Then I see something, I call it butterfly effect. I see that Middle East is so disbalanced that if you inter intervene, and you back up uh, Shia against Sunni in Iraq, uh, we have a phenomenon that will create epiphenomenon, and that will create another epiphenomenon, and it will be a change of phenomenon, and you're not able to control it. So you take one decision, you think it, it's not a diachronic decision, it's for the moment. You think that this is the right decision to, to back these forces, but then in, in this environment it produces another, another lack of balance that will produce another phenomenon in another phenomenon. Why I see is this vulnerability of the area? Because there are a lot of misbalances in the area. Take, for example, Libya. Libya has been governed by the tribe of uh, Muammar Gaddafi for a long period, which is not which is not uh, a prominent, uh, well-established tribes like the tribes from Kirinaik. Basically, Libya was in the hands of uh, Gaddafi and Warfala tribes. So you have, you have crushed the internal balance that sustained that country for one year. Iraq, for instance, you have a Tikriti clique governing a Shia majority. Syria, you have Alawites, minority, 10 or 12 percent, governing uh, a Sunni majority. So, in my opinion, the, the area is somehow trying to find the parameters of its uh, uh, normal balances. And of course, two issues won't watch, and they were mentioned. The first one is uh, the issue of legitimacy. Uh, what will be the, the causes and the main ideas and ideology or raison d'etre to, to govern? And the, the other one is the issue of authority. 
how the future constructions uh, will be constructed with two inevitable streamlines that will participate. One is democracy, of course, not uh, Wilsonian or Jeffersonian, and the other one is political Islam, inevitably. So, I conclude in a paradox. It seems to me that the Middle East entered into a postmodern world with no grand theory to, to explain that, uh, while skipping modernity. Middle East has always problem with modernity. Finally, from now, where to go? I see that uh, four categories, typological categories, we will we, we'll be witnessing in the Middle East. It, it has been mentioned by Amichai uh, areas of limited statehood or, or failed state or what, whatever you, you may you wish. And you have in that area non-state actors, different non-state actors, ideological, militia, tribal, organizational, gangs. But it will be a, a, an area with increased role of non-state actors. Then we have states that are, I mean, I mentioned non-state actors in, in, in this area. Then we have uh, states that are in an awful situation like Libya and Yemen. And we have a question mark whether, whether they will survive and continue to, to be what, uh, as a political entities. Then you have what I named semi-failed states. Semi-failed states is Syria or Iraq, whereby you have a system which continues to work, but losing part of sovereignty and territory. But still, system, the system is there. Still, this system provides uh, basic, basic uh, services and functions. And stable states with question mark, how stable? and what are the challenges ahead. I continue because Fukuyama was mentioned, but I remembered Rob, now I remembered Robert Kagan, who said that history is back and authoritarianism is back. Thank you very much. This was from me. Thank you, Dimitar, for another rich, uh, challenging set of uh, observations and concepts. Uh, I'm beginning to see some areas of agreement and disagreement, <laughs> uh, which, which uh, I'm sure we're all beginning to, to, to see. Uh, I think both the German and the Bulgarian ambassadors see quite a, uh, still potential for systemic fluidity and, and, and changes, uh, and really quite uh, limited uh, ability and wisdom even uh, to, to, to refer to, to Dimitar's butterfly effect of external intervention. It just makes external intervention so much more difficult uh, under the conditions that you have, uh, even if you had the appetite to do it, under the conditions that you've identified. And so, you need boots on the ground. <laughs> and butterfly nets, right? <laughs> okay. Um, um, and now... Um, uh, it's uh, really is a great privilege to uh, to in introduce uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jonathan uh, Spire, who is the director of the Rubin Center uh, for Research in International Affairs here at the IDC in, 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 Herz in Herzliya. Uh, Jonathan is known to, to many of you as a very prolific uh, journalist and author and really one of Israel's uh, uh, most knowledgeable and certainly, I think, brave <laughs> Israeli Middle East analyst. You this, wanna, you, this was the word I used. To yeah, brave is the word mm -hmm. because he actually conducts field research uh, in Syria and Iraq uh, uh, today uh, and reports from from the ground. You know, we I. Uh, you know, I, I sit in my ivory tower and then think about Hobbes and uh, and Wilson, uh, and uh, and, John, and Jonathan is there uh, in in the in the field. And I think one of the really the, the wonderful things about um, the IDC generally, but having uh, Jonathan Spy here with us, is that we we have a reality check of someone who uh, looks at things, uh, you know, as they they really occur. Uh, you will see him on CNN and Al Jazeera and Fox. He writes a weekly column for for the Jerusalem Post. And I don't know how he has the time, but he is also a prolific uh, author of books. Let me just mention two of his books, Nationalism in the Middle East, that was published in 2007, and uh, a book that was written in to, uh, published in 2010, The Transforming Fire, The Rise of the Israel-Islamist uh, uh, Conflict. 
Most importantly, though, Facebook informed me this morning that today is actually uh, Jonathan's birthday. So uh, he's chosen to, uh, to spend his birthday with us here today. And he will address us on uh, fractured states and the contending governing forces, Iraq and Syria, as case studies. Jonathan. Yom Uledet Sameach. Happy birthday. Yom Uledet Sameach. Well, thanks and uh, good morning. I'm going to try to be quite brief because I see that we are short of uh, time for our discussion. But what I want to try to do, in the, in the terms which, uh, which Amichai laid down at the start, uh, I learned that what I'm actually going to talk about is the role of non-state armed governors in an area of limited statehood. This is new terms for me, but this describes what I'm going to talk about, which is, uh, in effect, the uh, collapse of authority in Iraq and Syria, the emergence of would-be successor entities, and what, in my uh, estimation at least, we can perhaps learn uh, with regard to policy and with regard to trends uh, uh, in the uh, larger uh, Middle East. In Iraq and Syria today, uh, we witness the fracturing of these states into identifiably six different entities. These entities are, people are probably familiar with it, but let me go through it anyways. We have six areas. The first is the area ruled by uh, the thing that still calls itself the government of Iraq. Second is the area ruled over by the thing that still, with even perhaps less plausibility, calls itself the government of Syria. Thirdly, the area of the Kurdish regional government in northern Iraq, of course, ruled over by President Massoud Barzani. Fourth, the area traversing the borders of these countries, ruled by the thing which calls itself Islamic State. Hello. Fifthly, the, uh, now it's two, it used to be three, cantons, uh, in northern Syria, ruled over by the Syrian franchise of the PKK organization, the Kurdish uh, Workers' Party. And sixthly, the areas in northwest Syria, uh, and to a lesser extent in southwest Syria, ruled over by the Syrian rebels. Now, an interesting thing to note about all six of these areas is that in all six of them, organizations which uh, have appeared on the list of terror organizations of either the United States or European Union or both, are exercising either political authority or at least a very prominent political role. Again, if I can go through this again and just briefly support my theory with some empirical facts. So if we look at the area of the Iraqi government, of course, Iraq, Baghdad, and southwards is ruled by, the, uh, by Mr. Rabadi, Haider al Abadi, and the, uh, his cabinet and the Dawa party. But of course, since the uh, eruption of Islamic State into Iraq in June 2014, and the mobilization subsequently in mid-June 2014 of the thing called, which causes Hashta Shabi or popular mobilization forces after the fatwa issued by Ayatollah uh, Sistani, the Shia militias, pre-existing Shia militia forces, and specifically uh, Qtaib Hezbollah, Badr organization, and Ahl al-Haq, three prominent Shia militias, are playing an absolutely crucial role, firstly in defending uh, Baghdad from Islamic State, which of course is still only uh, around 60 kilometers west of the city in, uh, in Fallujah. And secondly, and this is crucial to what I want to say this morning, secondly, these organizations are exercising a form of political authority. That is to say that not all of them, but uh, prominent among them, the most prominent among them, Badr and Ahl al-Haq and Qtai Bizbala, are political actors as well as military actors. And indeed, in the case of Badr organization, uh, this uh, long-standing militia plays a, cru a crucial role as a member of the cabinet of Mr. Abadi, and specifically controlling the interior ministry in Iraq. That is to say that Badr organization, in addition to controlling its own large militia of around 50,000 fighters, also controls the Iraqi federal police force. It's important, and if you are a member of the, if you're a Sunni refugee in Baghdad, uh, it's particularly important because if you are the sub... Well, now somebody's trying to call me, excuse me. Hopefully it's not uh, Mr. Hadi al Amari from the Badr organization to wish me happy birthday. Uh, so uh, it's important for, if you're a Sunni refugee in Baghdad for the not particularly pleasant reason that if you are suffering from extortion at the hands of Shia militias, a very common and well-known phenomenon, you have no police force to call because Badr organization also controls the federal police. This was thus far with regard to Iraqi government. In the Syrian government area, of course, we know well 
the uh, Hezbollah organization plays an absolutely crucial role in the defense of and organization of the regime's uh, defenses, uh, firstly. And secondly, uh, the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps, of course, stepped in in the course of 2012-2013 when the regime was in serious trouble to create a brand new armed forces for the regime, sectarian-based uh, armed forces, which in many ways resembles a paramilitary or terror organization. Thirdly, the Kurdish regional government. Interesting to remember that both KDP, Kurdish Democratic Party, and PUK, Patri Patri Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, were on the United States list of terror organizations until not all that recently. Hard to imagine this now, especially in the case of Barzani, or KDP organization, but they were. And secondly, of course, we remember the de facto sovereign presence of PKK in a small northern enclave of KRG in Kandil Mountains area. And we note the crucial role and a very notable role, again, played by PKK fighters when Islamic State was sweeping into northern Iraq last summer. And this PKK fighters played a very key role in stiffening the backbone, one might say, uh, of, uh, of the Kurdish defense at that moment. Fourthly, Islamic State, well, it goes without saying, there what we have is Al-Qaeda in Iraq, effectively acting as a de facto sovereignty in the entirety of that area. Fifthly, the PKK cantons in northern Syria, again, goes without saying, an organization which, whether rightly or wrongly, is on the list of both EU and US terror, uh, list of terrorist organizations, is the de facto sovereignty. And sixthly, in the rebel areas, where we know, certainly in northwest Syria, not less so in southwest Syria, Certainly in northwest Syria, the uh, Syrian franchise of al-Qaeda, Jabhat al-Nusra, is the uh, dominant or most prominent uh, organization, playing both a crucial military and a crucial political uh, role. Thus far, then, with regard to empirical, very quick empirical survey, what I want to ask is what can we learn from this process? Is there anything which we can deduce from a very interesting situation in which a variety of uh, of in some cases quite well-known terrorist or, or paramilitary organizations uh, have, as a result of state collapse, of collapse of state authority, now uh, acquired roles and functions which they had not played before, not only in terms of prominent conventional, semi-conventional military activity, but also in terms of uh, playing vital administrative roles, in some cases as de facto governing authorities. Is there something, the question I want to ask is the following, is there something in the nature of such organizations which gives them uh, an evolutionary advantage, so to speak, an adaptive advantage in a situation in which state authority has collapsed over other types of organizations or bodies which may wish to compete for power in such an environment? And my answer I th from, from my study of uh, or ongoing or daily study of Sir Syrian and Iraqi situations is that there is... Uh, there is such an advantage, very clear and apparent. And the advantage is that in a situation in which state authority has collapsed, an organization which can, uh, as of itself, play both a political and a military role, has an advantage uh, in, in this situation. That's to say, an organization which can both create authority and also defend it in this situation will be one which you might well back to win in this situation. Now, this may sound quite abstract, so let me give you a practical answer, a practical example, which I th hope will make the point more uh, obvious. It's interesting to note that Nusra, in Jabhat al-Nusra in northwest Syria, has acquired its dominant position, among other ways, through the obliteration of, uh, of potential rivals. If we take three organizations, uh, then we can begin to understand the way in which this combination of political and military authority plays uh, its evolutionary E evolutionarily advantageous role, as I put it. Think of three organizations, Jabhat al-Nusra, which combines political and military authority, as I said. And then think of an organization which has only political authority, but is not capable of playing any kind of military role. To put it, uh, this is even a nice way of putting it. We take an example like Syrian National Council, which we used to read about a great deal in the Western media, probably you remember, Mr. Muaz al-Khatib, and these were the potential... Uh, new governors of Syria once Assad is taken down. One could meet them in five-star hotels in many nice places across uh, Europe at one moment. Here is an organization which, which had only, only political authority. And of course, which proved entirely unable to establish itself on the ground in the chaotic environment of Syria of the last four years because it had no, nothing to say with regard to military authority and therefore nobody had to listen to it. Nobody had to take any notice of it. Nobody did and it rapidly became irrelevant.
But if we take another example of an organization which was only capable of exercising military authority without any political content, without any political blueprint, and we have such an organization as a, an example, we can think of something called the Syrian Revolutionaries Front of a man called Jamal Ma'ruf, who was active, Dimitar uh, knows it well, in the Jabal Zawiya area, northwest of Syria, until his organization was obliterated by Jabal al-Nusra uh, some months ago. But here's the thing, why was Ma'ruf so easily obliterable? Because Ma'ruf essentially was a warlord. He knew how to do military activity, but he was completely incapable of administration, except on the basis of corruption and stealing stuff for him and his friends from Jabal Zawiya. Yeah? So, of course, when he was taken down, there was no authority. He was no, not able to appeal to any kind of legitimacy for his organization. On the contrary, it was a bunch of gangsters. And many of the people, when you travel in northern Syria or in southern Turkey and you interview people who join the jihadi organizations or support, who support them, what you will hear in these interviews, and I've conducted many of them, is not theological discussion, but rather such things as, well, when the jihadis came in and they took over a flour-making uh, uh, facility, they would distribute the bread for free to the needy people of the area, whereas when Maruf took it over, he would try to make money from it. And his interest was in robbing people and running uh, goods across the border. The combination, therefore, of political and military authority, the ability to create a coherent, if primitive, governing structure and to effectively defend it, proves itself in the situation of collapsed authority in Syria and Iraq to be particularly evolutionarily uh, advantageous. This is then, I want to make two points, and that's really the first point. That when we note these kind of organizations and the ones who are, who are doing well, it's not surprising that we find that a long list of pre-existing political military organizations are the ones who are doing well and proliferating across this space. And I listed them at the beginning, so I won't list them uh, again. This was the, f the point number one. The second and last point that I want to make relates to the role of states in this uh, collapsed spaces. And what I want to suggest uh, is that it is states who are best able to make alliance with and to make coherent uh, sponsorship of political military organizations of the type I've been discussing, which are the states which are best placed to do well in the sense of pursuing successfully their own advantage and their own agenda inside these, uh, these areas. States which are not able to do so, or which do not wish to do so for moral or ethical reasons perhaps, will find it very difficult to pursue successfully their own goals in these uh, areas. And again, I want to take a couple of examples to illustrate this point, actually four examples, and this is the final part of my talk. Amichai mentioned uh, in his talk uh, correctly, in my estimation, the uh, notable success which the Iranians have had in this space, Iraq and Syria, and elsewhere in the region, in promoting their interests uh, in this, uh, these areas. Um, he's right. They certainly have been done well in both Iraq and in Syria. My estimation is that the Iranians do well for the following reason. The Iranians have a, a state agency whose uh, raison d'etre whose specific task is the creation and sponsorship of proxy, political, religious, military organizations in order to utilize those organizations to further the interests of the state of, of the Iranian state. This is, of course, the Quds Force of Islamic Revolutionary Guard School, which everybody here is familiar with. But it's important to remember, this is not simply an intelligence gathering organization. It is not simply a military organization. Specifically, it has this ideological goal, which in normal times when states are strong and state security services are strong, the possession by a state of such an agency might appear to be nothing more than an absurd conceit or a decoration in which a state can pretend to be an ideological state and therefore different from its neighbors and so on and so forth. But in a situation of collapse and of uh, proliferation of, of, uh, of uh, successor entities, the possession of such an agency and of a group, a cadre of men with proven skills in this regard, is worth its weight in gold, and has proven itself worth its weight in gold in both the Iraqi and in the Syrian context. And let me give just two brief examples to, before we move on. I mentioned uh, in the beginning, when Bashar Assad got into very serious trouble at the end of 2012, because of the key flaw, which he has not yet, he, he's unable to cope with, the key flaw of the absence of sufficient numbers of men willing to take a bullet for him, and when the rebellion entered into Aleppo in summer of 2012, 
And also, if you remember, there was this very this successful terror attack, or I'm not sure if we call it terror attack if it's against Bashar Assad, yeah, but okay. this explosion against which Asif Shaukat and others were killed uh, inside security zone in, in Damascus. July 2012. July 2012. July 2012. Absolutely right. And then in August, shortly afterwards, the re rebellion explodes into uh, Aleppo. The battle for Aleppo begins uh, and very bloodily in August and September. The regime was in real trouble. But by April 2013, we were all reading about, and correctly, regime recovery. What had happened in the meantime? What happened in the meantime was that a brand new military force entered the field in Syria, called the, uh, in English it's called the National Defense Forces, or Jaysh al-Shaabi in, uh, in Arabic. And this organization effectively was, the, organiz was the, the gathering of sectarian paramilitaries who were uh, engaged on a local level prior to that by the Revolutionary Guards Corps, by the representatives of Quds Force of IRGC, into a coherent nationwide organization, light, lightly trained, but sufficiently trained, who could then be inserted into the battlefield uh, in crucial areas to hold the line uh, for the regime. Example one. Example two, I already mentioned it of the Iranian role. When, when, uh, when uh, Daesh, when ISIS is heading for Baghdad, is gunning for Baghdad in June 2014, it is the mobil effective mobilization of the, uh, of the uh, Shia militias and not in any way whatsoever the role played by the Western-trained uh, Iraqi security forces which stops them on uh, the way to Baghdad. Of course, the role of uh, coalition bombing is important too, but it's worth remembering that it's coalition air forces in cooperation with Shia militias which are the issue here. So two examples, the way in which the Iranians are uniquely well equipped for cooperating with these de facto authorities on the ground in an effective way. The Sunni Arab powers, of course, have been distinctive, distinctly less successful, uh, partly simply because of an absence of experience in this regard. But it is worth noting that the Sunni Arab powers are getting better at this. And if we look at what's happening in northwest Syria today, the emergence of a thing called Jaysh al-Fatah, yeah, the uh, union of, of client militias of different Sunni states of Saudi Arabia, of Qatar, and of Turkey into a single not a single body, but a body which is able to, uh, to coordinate between the militias. This, in my estimation, is, is, is a key reason why the regime is doing so very badly in northwest Syria today and why the regime and its friends, notably the Russians, are so very concerned about the possibility of a rebel entry into Latakia province in northwest Syria, which could mean disaster for the regime. Two last examples of uh, states who are trying hard to cope in this area and interesting to see how they are cope, how they're doing well or not doing so well. The United States has uh, had both successes and failures in this Syrian-Iraqi context. Let me concentrate on Syria for the examples I want to give with relation to the United States. There have been failures, I don't wish to sound, uh, I don't wish to be uh, cynical, to sound sarcastic, but there have been failures which uh, almost reached the level of comedy. Um, and if we think of this example, think of the uh, last month, this entry of the uh, 64 fighters, was it, of this thing, Division 30, which, try, which goes across, excuse me, 67 fighters? Okay, 67 fighters, which go across the border uh, and, of course, immediately are brought into the welcoming arms of Jabhat al-Nusra, and there's the end of Division 30, even to the extent to which the Americans were trying to say initially. Their initial spin was actually they never had anything to do with us. So this is the, uh, the more ludicrous side. But the very serious and successful side of American policy uh, in the last year and the, in Syria, and there has been a very notable success, is when United States air power partners with a powerful paramilitary actor on the ground, namely the Kurdish YPG, then we see the way in which very real victories are achieved against uh, ISIS. ISIS is pushed back from an enormous swathe of area close to the Syrian-Turkish border, and the combination of United States air power and Kurdish uh, military organization on the ground, neither of which could do without the other as part of this success, brings anti-ISIS forces to within 50 kilometers north of Raqqa, of the capital of uh, Islamic State. So again, in terms of what I'm trying to say here, when we see the example where the Americans cooperate with the uh, ecosystem on the ground and find a workable partner among the political military organizations which are flourishing in the way that I introduced a few minutes ago, then you have success. And when we see an example in which the Americans don't wish to work with the ground as it exists, but wish to make their own uh, version of reality, then we see failure on a very profound level, something I think which is worth taking into account. And the last example, since we're here in Herzliya, should be the example of Israel in the Syrian uh, context. 
because, of course, Israel has also been pursuing its own very quiet and interesting policy in southwest Syria with much more limited aims than the other actors I mentioned. The aim is not to uh, affect the final outcome of the Syrian war, but rather to ensure the Israeli interest uh, west of Kunetra crossing, so to speak, uh, that's to say in the Golan Heights and for the Israeli communities there. And as we, we don't hear too much about it, but certainly what we hear, the impression is that something like a virtual security zone has been created east of Kunetra Crossing, and it has been created as a result of cooperation on a variety of levels between Israel and elements among the rebellion uh, in southwest Syria. As of now, this very quiet uh, but determinedly pursued policy appears to have achieved the aim set by Israel, which is to ensure that the entirety of the border east of, immediately east of Kunetra is in the hands of rebel organizations of one kind or another and not in the hands of Assad slash Hezbollah slash uh, IRGC. So this is a final example of a modest goal, but pursued in quite a rational way, it seems, with up until now at least a considerable degree of success. So just to conclude, then, I've basically made two points. The first point is that political military organizations, for reasons I gave, appear to enjoy uh, an evolutionary advantage in terms of the current reality uh, pertaining in the states formerly known as uh, Iraq and Syria. And the second point is that states which wish to uh, enjoy success in terms of pursuing their own goals uh, will be the, have been until now and will continue to be, I would estimate, those states who are able to develop relations with and partner effectively with these uh, political military organizations who, at least for now and perhaps uh, still to come, are the existing powers on the ground in those countries. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, not, not just for your bravery and the micro-knowledge of what's, what's happening, but also for, I think, hard-headed um, ideas about uh, uh, where we might go, uh, uh, go going forward. Um, last but not least, Ambassador uh, Ivo Schwartz, the, the ambassador of the Czech Republic uh, here in Israel. I first had the, the great uh, privilege of uh, meeting uh, um, Ivo uh, before he became uh, uh, ambassador in, in, uh, in Prague. He, he was then uh, the uh, director general of the Czech external intelligence uh, service, uh, a role that he, he played um, uh, for, for seven years, from 2007 till 2014. Uh, before this, he had had a, a long and a very varied and, and, and distinguished career in the Czech external intelligence service, I guess our own, uh, the Czech version of Mossad. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, before that, uh, he uh, served for, for eight years as the director of the Immigration and Border uh, uh, Police uh, of Western Bohemia region in the, in the, Czech, uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, and we're just delighted uh, that he has replaced Tomasz Poyar as, uh, not that he's replaced <laughs> Tomasz Poyar, but uh, that the successor that was found to our dear friend and IDC graduate uh, Tomasz uh, Poyar is uh, Ambassador Ivo Schwartz, and Ivo will speak about, uh, about the implications for Europe. And when we designed this program, we thought that it might be relevant, but didn't, we didn't guess how relevant it was going to, uh, to be, given the news over the last uh, week in particular, implications for Europe and some uh, possible policy directions. Uh, Ivo, please, the floor is yours. Okay, still good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bokatov, thank you, Mikhail, for very kind words. It's very nice to compare us with Mossad. Uh, as uh, last speaker in the row, I have the uh, nice but also complicated position in the same way because almost everything has been said by my uh, colleagues. So and because also the time passes so quickly, so I will try to be brief. Just allow me a couple of uh, remarks, uh, and I will let them more time for for the discussion. Uh, what has been mentioned since uh, 2011, since the something what was called the Arab Spring, and after that quickly uh, changed to the Mena Winter. Uh, the situation here in this region has changed opened a new new era. All these pro-democracy protests in the countries like, like Egypt, Syria, Libya, Yemen also, um, enter into the period uh, unprecedented turmoil, 
revolutions with violence and civil war. Uh, in some countries like Tunisia or Morocco, the protests provoke the significant changes in the political system. Uh, also the creation, something what is called the Islamic State, or better maybe Daesh, because it's not a state in fact, has increased the Iranian uh, government's more inclusion or interventions in Syria and the region here, Iraq of course as well. And also the Saudi Arabia as um, another part of, the, of this uh, business uh, increased the involvement here in, the, in these conflicts. Uh, these changes definitely also had, have uh, already had a strong impact to, to Europe. The enormous wave of uh, migrants, illegal migrants, let's say, from uh, Middle East and Africa provoked a long political discussion uh, in, in Brussels. Unfortunately, hasn't been finished yet. Such kind of discussion, uh, more than 200,000 uh, of people and estimated one third of them, which were civilians, uh, died violently during the conflicts uh, in Syria, Iraq, Libya, which makes the conflicts uh, one of the bloodiest uh, here in the, in, the, in the Middle East. We are witnessing the, the worst refugee crisis uh, in all modern era, let's say, according to the report of European Union, the year 2013, for the first time since the 1914, the number of the refugees was more than uh, 50 million, and this year definitely won't be better. We expect or estimate the numbers about the 80 million of refugees. Uh, in addition, all these uh, instances of demographic phenomena, because from European uh, point of view, it's still something like a demographic. Then also the, the, demo, uh, the number of Europeans uh, or European people joining the Islamic fighters in Syria and Iraq has also risen. risen and also has the possibilities of threats uh, of terrorist attacks in European Union countries. What is worse that the, the process of radicalization speeds up and also became or is becoming more indirect. Um, from my previous career, I can mention the example that some people, some youngsters were radicalized, radicalized only via the internet, only via social media, without any direct touch with any imams or, or, or mosque. Uh, this procedure was uh, counted in months, so we have the example specifically in the Balkan countries when the people after half year from the first touch with something uh, were seen in the, in the training camps in Afghanistan or Pakistan or, or, or part, of, part of Iraq. Um, from economic point of view, uh, the growing instability in s this oil exporting region uh, was, has prompted also major concerns to, to European uh, oil supply and economic and energy si situation. Uh, so the, the, the term or the obvious long-term goal, a peaceful and stable Middle East, is not only a war more goal for, for us, but uh, would also entail direct security benefits for Europe, encouraging trained investment and secure access to energy sources. However, long-term interests are far more often overshadowed by narrower, short-sighted uh, ones. Uh, European Union politicians are stemming in the flow of migrants and refugees, containing the region's conflicts and preventing extremists from carrying out attacks in Europe, rather than to, to applying the full weight of the Union's diplomatic and financial resources to help and the, 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 the wars that spawned these problems. I'm not uh, totally politically correct here, but I'm speaking more as, as a former you know, the intelligence officer than a diplomat. Uh, indeed, the European Union, just like the rest of the international community, was simply not prepared for, for such kind of development and disaster in the Middle East. Uh, this led to over-reliance on the securitized responses to fundamentally political problems, uh, creating un unintended uh, consequences that help to force radicalization rather than counter it. Uh, European Union is now, I don't want to say speak about uh, the crisis of Western civilization, as Fukuyama mentioned, but definitely we are facing to reshaping of basic principles of existence of Western democracy, let's say. Uh, let me give two, two examples. One can be called NATO and, and ISIL or, or Daesh. On one side, the General Secretary of uh, NATO mentioned many times that, that ISIL or Daesh is uh, among the uh, crucial threats threat of, of uh, NATO and NATO, NATO countries. 
On the other side, the, the second biggest uh, army, speaking about the manpower, I'm speaking about Turkish, can, uh, Turkish army, is just on the, on the touch, on the border with Israel, and instead of fight against the this, uh, Israel, is uh, bombing and, and fighting against the Kurds in, in the area. So there's something, something uh, was to discuss about the basic principles, and for example, from the point of view of, let's say, the Baltic countries, how they can be sure that, that Articles 4 and 5, the uh, North Atlantic Treaty, can be used uh, in the case of some troubles with Russia, for example. And the second example, which is for me maybe more sensitive, as, as a guy who grew up uh, in the communist era in Czechoslovakia, when the travel abroad was forbidden fruit, we were allowed to travel to, to Eastern Germany or also to Bulgaria. Uh, and uh, now we are speaking about uh, the crisis of basic principles of Schengen area, because what we can see right now, and I spoke about uh, uh, the Europeans fighting in the, in the Islam, uh, Islamic State or in Afghanistan before, in Iraq right now, uh, opens the discussion about something what is what is the what is the paradise for for european to travel across the europe without any passports without with simple documents uh, but this freedom of uh, movement of persons and goods as well uh, opens also the, the the pandora's box for the persons who are the bad guys on the territory but not only about the persons but also about the, the explosives drugs so Something like a limited um, decreasing of principle of Schengen is also on the table. I understand it's a very sensitive issue, specifically for the countries where the democracy has the long uh, tradition, but it's uh, definitely legal to speak about it. Uh, so I, I promise to be brief, so I will finish. Uh, speaking about the conclusion, I, I definitely don't have any conclusion because everything is still in process. I mean, I mentioned a couple of very provocative questions here, which is, uh, which is true, and, and uh, I will be more <coughs> glad to, to participate in the discussion. Maybe one more provocative conclusion, which was given by President Zeman in the regular meeting with uh, ambassadors in the end of, uh, of uh, August, when we spoke about uh, such kind of question, uh, President Zeman, uh, Zeman said, you know, the, the, the European Union should be a, more the player in the region than just the payer. So that's at my conclusion. Thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you very much, Amb Ambassador uh, Schwartz, for uh, brevity. Uh, and, uh, and and your and your ideas. Uh, I think that the desire of the European Union to be a player, not just a payer, is sort of a, the only constant. I think <laughs> in an otherwise very uh, very turbulent uh, relationship between uh, Europe and, uh, and and the MENA region. Well, we have uh, something like uh, you know a good forty five minute, fifty minutes for uh, for for discussion. Uh, Michael, please take a seat. Don't sit on that. Do Dr. Michael Bolcha, the director of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung here in Israel. Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us. So I think to say that there's a lot on the table would be sort of a, uh, a an understatement. Uh, again, I begin to see some convergence, some uh, some. Uh, uh, patterns of uh, agreement, but also also disagreement. But I'd much rather uh, open it up and and, uh, and 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 get your uh, our audience participation. Uh, please try to formulate uh, sentences with a question mark at the end rather than uh, <laughs> statements. But uh, please, yes, uh, madam, and identify yourself if you can. Just introduce yourself briefly. And, uh, My name is Nikon Mayer. I'm French Canadian. Um, I'm an electronic engineer technologist by but I'm also my PhD is in uh, international markets, the commodity market. So I look at it from an electronic <coughs> point of view and a financial expert. So here's the thing. I agree with you uh, that it is actually a digital communication problem. As an electronic technologist, the chart for 2007 to me has a major impact because this is when the electronic infrastructure 
went from New York downtown with an old coax cable, which had a speed of 100 gigabytes, to move away from Manhattan and went into the center, uh, I can't remember the name exactly of the place, which used optical uh, cables, which went for 100 megabytes per second to over 750 megabytes per second. Now, I do remember the big fights in the um, international markets building itself because people were fighting to be the closest to the servers, which means the closer you are to the server, the faster you can sell and buy your share. Here's the thing that we found, like me as a PhD study in investment, what we call the, the, the penny markets, which come from Africa, was heavily impacted on that move. It's a physical move that sounds like nothing. Electronic, it's make it easier for uh, the electronic people to, uh, the, the investors using the electronics, for sure, in Europe and in the United States, but it made it far harder for the international markets in Africa to still use coax and use uh, an alloy of, of optical cabling. Their speed is much lower, hence they can't really compete. Your 2007 meant that the market went down. Now, here's my question. I was in Syria. Uh, as an electronic engineer,